Hey there, Father Michael here. So, I don't know if this is a senior moment kind of thing or maybe the onset of early dementia, but lately, when I get out of bed in the morning, I've got some melody or song in my head and it's random. And today, <laughs> it's probably more random than most. I'm thinking about this crazy ass song that we used to sing back in Catholic school in the late 60s, early 70s called I Cannot Come. And it's like, I cannot come, I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused. I cannot come. Bum, 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 bum. And so it's in my head. It, it's just probably going to hang out there all day. The song really comes from a parable in Luke 14. And in the parable, God is giving this big ass banquet, this banquet of abundant celebrations and joys and, you know, every blessing you can think of for humanity. But people keep coming up with reasons why they just don't want to do it. <laughs> they, they don't want to do it. You know, somebody, oh, someone just got married. Somebody else bought, you know, like five oxen and they just need to go test drive them out in the fields with, with, with their plow. And all kinds of crazy, ridiculous reasons why I just cannot come to this banquet of abundance in this life. To me, it is not a parable about you know, heaven, which is, you know, some some crazy place light years away. It's about living this life now because salvation is now. Jesus says it all the time in the gospel. Salvation has come to this house today. Not, Jesus never says, well, why don't you just suffer and be miserable? And then I will, you know, we'll re-up later. We'll make everything cool later in in a place far, far from this galaxy. That never happens. That is some later bullshit, really, to be honest. When I was in seventh grade, in Sister Sharon's class, Sister Sharon was cool. She wasn't like the old school nuns. Number one, she had brown hair that showed under her little uh, veilette <laughs> or, or whatever it was called back in the day, uh, an abbreviated form of, of the habit that sisters wore. And she had brown hair and she did not have any wrinkles. And she was just a cool, gentle person. And she's the first person that ever pulled me aside to tell me that I was gifted at something. And it made me feel really good. She told me that I was a gifted writer and that I just needed to keep writing that I should never let that go. Well, on the one hand, I felt great and I felt affirmed and all of that. But on the other hand, writing almost came too easy for me. I rarely did like a rough draft and then a rewrite as a kid or in high school or even in college. I just banged these suckers out and, and off they went, you know, to the professor or the teacher. And okay, in high school, I did uh, manage to get something published in some some crazy thing, who's who of uh, crazy ass students or something like that. And, uh, you know, worked uh, on the student newspaper trying to, trying to do things like that. And then later on, um, I did have a monthly uh, arrangement with a local publication to do a, a monthly article. Um, and I'm still, you know, I am still writing. Um, you know, I write a sermon every week trying to make sense of, <laughs> of the scriptures. I try to keep it, you know, based on the word, the written word. 
I've been working on that book that I've been talking about for, oh my goodness, seven, eight years. For a long time, I thought nobody would really be interested in reading my stuff anyway. So, you know, got easily distracted. Raised some kids. I don't, don't think I wrote much in those years when the kids were little. But I've come to realize that it is part of my larger calling from God. It's a way, it's a way for me to really do some positive things and, you know, redress something that I've always hated about the Catholic Church. Probably the most annoying thing. And that is Catholic priests in general give the worst sermons. They do not prepare. They got a whole week to put something intelligent and thought-provoking and useful together. And, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I gotta tell you, I can probably count on one hand the number of sermons in Catholic churches that I have heard that actually were useful and insightful. Most of them have just been random stream of consciousness type things, and they fill their whole seven minutes reminding us that homosexuality and abortion uh, go together, which I'm still not clear on, and, and that they're bad. And that's about it. A few references to church discipline and doctrine, and we're going to, you know, woohoo, I got that sermon out of the way. That is not a sermon, bro. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not useful to anybody. Really, we already know what the corporate policies are. So I try to redress that thing. It's a, it's a lifelong peeve of mine. And so I'm still writing. I'm still doing my thing. I'm still trying, you know, I think some of mine are better than others, clearly. But I try to give something useful as I write that sermon out. I have to write the whole thing out to make it all gel in my mind. And if you've been creeping on me on Facebook Live, on, on either of my congregation's pages, even though I give the same sermon twice, it's never quite the same. The energy is different because the congregations are different. The situation is different. So, and I never obey the seven minute rule, by the way, which is what they tell us in seminary. No more than seven minutes. People do, do not want to listen for more than seven minutes. Well, mine are more like 17 or 20 minutes long. So strap yourself in because I promise you, I probably have at least one useful thing to say. That's, that's my goal. That parable of the dinner party from God. I think that is a great metaphor for this life. God is inviting us at every moment to step into the banquet hall, to have a seat at God's banquet, and to feast. Oh my goodness, and we come up with all kinds of bullshit reasons why we just can't do it. Oh, oh not me. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. We have all kinds of crazy excuses. We, we have fields of of distrust and, and, and resentment that we're so busy tending to, mostly directed at ourselves. We're hiding behind veils of shame and feelings that, you know, everybody else is worthy of forgiveness, but not me. Oh, I couldn't possibly forgive myself. We're crying out for justice in our world but we aren't living it. We aren't even seeing that our own heart is divided. We're in a relationship with heroin or fentanyl or alcohol or some bullshit like that. And we don't even realize how dysfunctional that relationship is because it is. You get in a relationship with the bottle or the bag and that relationship takes over everything everything, even the relationship with God. The drug becomes God in our universe because we're willing to do anything to keep that relationship going. 
we thirst for simple communion with other people, but ooh, we're going to stay living in fear, locked behind closed doors, just like those disciples in today's gospel reading. We are terrified for whatever reason, terrified to step out into the light and embrace joy and abundance and new life. We're just terrified, terrified to take up God's invitation. We're all given gifts. The gifts are part of our calling to ministry. It's not just priests who have a vocation. And priests don't have the highest vocation either. Don't let them tell you otherwise. We are supposed to be servants of the servants. That puts us at the bottom of the pyramid, not the top. So, look at your gifts. Do you love to read and to write? Go volunteer to read and teach children, you know, how to read. Do you love to cook? Go volunteer at the freaking soup kitchen or uh, at the women's shelter and do that for other people. Are you technologically savvy? Great. Go step up in your church or community and volunteer to do something with that. Do you love animals more than people? I get it. <laughs> animals are definitely nicer than people. Go volunteer at the SPCA. Come on now, it's not that deep. The banquet is waiting. And you're not only called to partake, but you're also to bring something, to bring a dish to pass. That's where your gifts come in. I really do believe that at the end of this life, God is not going to nail us with a gigantic sin list. Like, oh, Michael, you stole cookies when you were six years old out of grandma's cookie jar. Oh, look, there you are, stealing pieces of ham out of the roasting pan before dinner is served on Easter. I don't think that God exists. But I do think that God is probably going to look us in the eye and say, would you please explain to me how it is that you refused my invitation to abundance so many times and preferred to stay in your own misery. St. Mame Dennis of New York says it best. Life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. Let's pray. <sighs> Loving God, we open our hearts and our minds to your divine abundance today. For all the times that we have refused your gifts, gently turned away with excuses, Forgive us. Give us insight today, loving God, to choose to see abundance instead of lack. Help us to see the banquet is set for us because you have made us worthy as your daughters and sons. And as we feast today, in your presence. Help us to determine which of our gifts we can share at this banquet of life. Help us to stop making excuses. Help us to stop choosing misery instead of joy. Help us to put aside our relationship with drugs or alcohol or gambling, or shopping, and to realize that there is only one God, and it is you, and you alone. 
most of all, gracious God, help us to love ourselves and to see ourselves as a key component of this banquet that you are preparing for all people. For all the challenges, the sorrows and the heartache and the laughter, we thank you. Amen. Make today count.